Uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. I'm Boris Reznikov, Director of Business Development at the Stellar Development Foundation. I'll be your host today for this discussion on Anchor Basics uh, as we share more about the business of anchors and the benefits that they bring to the network. So here's a quick look at what we'll cover today. Uh, we'll start by going over the basics about you know, what an anchor does, why its function is fundamental to the network. Um, that will be covered uh, by Jed if he's able to, uh, to join on, on Zoho, uh, or if not, our CEO, Danelle Dixon, uh, will share that piece, uh, as well as the second piece, which is uh, more details about the business of uh, being an anchor and, and what those opportunities look like. Um, focusing both on how anchors can join the network today and what that can look like in the future. And then the third piece, uh, I'll wrap up by sharing more about the path to becoming an anchor, uh, what the requirements are, and what resources are available to help you embark on that journey. And with that, I will turn that over to uh, Danelle to discuss what anchors are and what benefits they bring to the network. Thanks, Boris. Hi, everyone. Uh, I know I don't look like Jed, but hopefully we'll get Jed in just a minute. Uh, happy to be here today to talk more about the anchor model for the Stellar Network. When, when Stellar was created, it was in response to the fact that today's system is just, it doesn't work for everyone. Today's payment landscape is fragmented, it's slow, costly, it's based on models unchanged for decades despite new technology. Of the hundreds of different monetary systems, each has its own unique set of services, ACH, SEPA, SPET, et cetera, and connections to the parallel systems outside its borders. Assets exist in silo databases, just disparate payment schemes, and uh, to interoperate between these systems, it takes time and a lot of money. All of these disparate bank, banks, money transfer operators, and, treasure, and treasuries combine to make up the entire global financial system as we know it today. At its best, today's system is slow, cumbersome, and fraught with fees. At its worst, it leaves millions of people marginalized. To bridge these disparate local payment systems, Stellar makes it possible to represent the world's currencies in the form of digital fiat tokens. On one decentralized ledger where there can be all interop where they can all interoperate freely. This allows currencies to interoperate not just among each other, but also among all the wallets and apps that leverage the Stellar network to provide users a wide variety of cost-effective financial services. Anchors play a fundamental role in creating that decentralized interoperable system. So what are anchors and what do they do? So I first wanna say that anchor, the term anchors is a word that's really unique to Stellar. And we know that. And so that's why we wanna describe what that is uh, because it's such an important and integral part of our system. So to facilitate moving value from the traditional banking system into Stellar and vice versa, the network relies on what we call anchors. <clears throat> anchors are regulated financial institutions, money services businesses, or fintech companies that offer specific services to the network. Anchors are unique in some ways, both in terminology and in function to the Stellar network. But the easiest way to think of them more broadly is, to, is a stable coin issuer. But that's a bit reductionist because for us, there's a, it's a lot more than just that. Anchors on Stellar serve two main functions. They issue fiat tokens and, or they provide a fiat on an off ramp. First, as issuers of fiat tokens, they issue one-to-one -one fiat backed tokens, also known as stable coins, and maintain fiat reserves equivalent to the, to the value of the issued tokens. So users can redeem them back to fiat at any time. But on its own, that's just not enough. You, you actually need a way for people to get those tokens, to get onto the blockchain. Uh, so that's where an anchor's second function comes into play. As providers of fiat on and off ramps, anchors connect the Stellar network to the anchors country banking system by maintaining a service that handles regulatory processes such as KYC, Know Your Customer, or AML, the anti-money laundering, and allows users to make seamless deposits and withdrawals. Anchors on our network can serve one or both of these roles. More often than not today, they do both, but the future we'll see what the future holds. These two roles can be provided by a single entity or by multiple entities, in which case the fiat on and off ramps become a reseller of the fiat tokens issued by the token issuers. 
So this is a fundamental function for the network because it enables interoperability. Anchor services help create a world where the existing financial system is connected and interoperable with Stellar. Interoperability allows assets to move seamlessly on, within, and off the Stellar network. Concretely, this means that making real world assets useful in the digital world and then back again. So let's walk through what interoperability looks like in practice. Let's say there's an anchor that issues a fiat backed token like a digital dollar. That means users around the world have access to this token, knowing it's, a sta it's stable and backed by USD. If that anchor sets up an on-ramp, users of the token are able to buy, spend, and send dollars across the Stellar network. For example, they can send dollar tokens to their family in Europe, thanks to a Euro anchor who has issued a digital Euro. And what that Euro anchor also provides is the off-ramp, so those users are able to withdraw real world euros. When these two digital assets and on and off ramps work together to create a connected global financial infrastructure, that's how interoper interoperability comes to life. Anchors create a world of connections and that means a world with over 180 plus different monetary systems could work together on a single platform. That represents billions of people in the world being able to seamlessly transact and interact. This is how we build a new global financial infrastructure. And that includes and works for so many other people in the world. So now I'm gonna share more on how anchors build businesses and opportunities around them. So first, uh, the, the, uh, as we shared before, they are anchors are crucial for the network success and a central part of how the network operates. It's important to note that you don't have to be a bank to be an anchor. Many types of financial institutions can satisfy the requirements of being an anchor, something Boris will address in just a few minutes. But not surprisingly, anchors are really a top priority for us at the Stellar Development Foundation. We're putting a lot of effort into growing this base of anchors that we already have. In part, it's for all the reasons that I just talked about, but it's also because there's a big opportunity for anchors in terms of new users, new business growth, and exponential brand opportunity. Stellar is paving the path forward toward a new global payment standard. That's where we wanna be by 2025. And anchors have an integral place in helping us to get there. As the critical link between the Stellar network and the traditional banking system in their respective countries, Anchors are positioned to leverage a variety of business models and monetization strategies, including deposit withdrawal fees, FX spread, signerage, and transaction fees. Successful anchors offer anchor services as part of a larger portfolio of products and services that leverage the efficiency of Stellar to provide new, cost-effective financial services, ranging from API-based banking as a service offerings to cross-border B2B payment and invoicing, remittances, peer-to-peer -peer payments, international payroll, or two-sided marketplace payments. These opportunities exist depending on what kind of anchor you are, whether you're an issuer or a provider of on and off ramps, or both. So the most successful anchors that we're seeing today are the ones that build products around the anchor services that they provide. So I wanna share a few very specific examples of the anchors that we're seeing on the network. But I also want to highlight that we have a growing list of global anchors. You can see them in the box there. Many of whom are playing a key role in the upcoming vibrant product launch targeted at Latin America. But first, I want to focus on Kauri. Kauri is a Nigerian-based fintech company that builds and operates electronic payment systems. Kauri is both the on-ramp and off-ramp and the asset. They have a digital asset issued on Stellar pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the Nigerian Naira. This NGNT token is seamlessly connected into the Nigerian Interbank Payment Network, NIBSS, which allows for instant bank payments and that complete in two minutes and are available 24-7, 365 days. Users are able to make easy deposits and withdrawals since Calories Anchor Service is integrated into a number of Stellar wallets, in addition to their own platform. Then we also have Settle. Settle, the Settle Network is an Argentinian-based digital asset settlement network operating across Latin America. 
They are anchors for the Argentinian peso, the Brazilian real, and the Mexican peso, and including a number of additional regional currencies that are already in the works. Seto leverages this infrastructure to support both exchange-related use cases as well as cross-border payments. For example, Vibrant, the company, the upcoming LATAM-focused app, will be leveraging the anchor infrastructure Settle has built to build to allow for Argentine users to make deposits and withdrawals. And then we have Tempo. Tempo is our oldest anchor. It is a Paris-based money transfer operator and currently the primary Euro anchor operating on Stellar. They've issued the Euro T token since 2017 and use it to facilitate cost-effective money transfers both into and out of the Eurozone. Tempo has an existing user base of customers who remit money to their families in the developing world and is increasingly supporting B2B payments via EuroT as well. And finally, Vinclusive, who's our newest anchor, the USD anchor. Uh, it's building two promising solutions for the Stellar ecosystem. First, unlike the other anchors I just mentioned, Vinclusive does not issue their own digital asset, but rather acts as a seamless on and off ramp for an existing one, Anchor USD. They are offering this on and off ramp combined with their expertise in compliance to bring compliance centered banking to the billions of people that are underserved by today's banking system. And second, the Vinclusive team is leveraging this expertise to offer compliance as a service platform to all the other anchors on the network to help them onboard users faster, safer, and cheaper. So as you can see, all of these anchors are building businesses around services and products. In the future, the anchor opportunity will surely evolve and we can't wait to see that happen as we have more transactions and liquidity on the network. But these initial use cases are the foundation for driving network effects on Stellar. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Boris and he's gonna take over and focus on what it takes to become an anchor today. Thank you, Danelle. So we've been hard at work for the past few years to streamline the process of becoming an anchor for the companies that choose to go down that path. And I'm happy to report that for financial institutions, both banks and non-bank uh, fintech companies, the path to becoming an anchor is more straightforward today than it has been ever before. And so for those of you that are curious about what it would take to become an anchor, uh, I'd like to take the next few minutes to walk you through uh, what that path looks like. So um, alluding to uh, what Danelle just spoke about, the first step is to determine how this anchor service fits in with the greater product vision, whether that's supporting your current line of products or if you plan on building out a brand new uh, product suite uh, or, or service suite around the anchor. Uh, you know, in, in today's low interest rate environment, it's become quite clear that it's very difficult to build a sustainable business that relies on interest income alone. I'm referring to the interest that you could earn off, off the reserve balance that you hold on behalf of users. Uh, so it's important to build it around uh, a larger product vision, whether that's supporting B2B, cross-border payments, invoicing, uh, money transfer for remittance, lending or e-commerce and uh, merchant payments or some combination of all of these. We found that the most successful anchors on Stellar so far are the ones who put a lot of thought into this particular step and start the integration with a fully formed picture of why they're doing it. So moving on to the next step, of course, any anchor that wants to hold balances on behalf of customers will need the appropriate licensing required in their home jurisdiction. So in the, in the US, that means likely registering as a money service business or an MSB with FinCEN, uh, as well as holding state-by-state -state money transmitter licenses. Uh, and other countries, of course, will have their own requirements for this. Um, some smaller companies we've found uh, often rely on their banking partners for some of these licenses. For example, uh, for a smaller company in the States, it's fairly cost prohibitive to go state-by-state uh, to get their MTLs or money transmitter licenses. So they'll work with partners like Prime Trust, for example, to, to leverage their existing regulatory umbrella so that they can get to market faster. Uh, most of the time, we find that anchors are existing financial institutions that already hold these licenses as part of their you know, daily operations today. 
And so luckily for these companies, becoming a stellar anchor doesn't require any additional regulatory licenses or, or permissions over what they might already have. Once your regulatory picture is clear, um, you will want to set up your banking and KYC connections. So connections to the uh, local banking network in your, in your country. Um, on a similar note, most companies will already have this set up as part of their existing services. Uh, for example, if you're an exchange, uh, crypto exchange, you're already accepting customer deposits and facilitating withdrawals. Uh, the same can be said about money transfer operators, peer-to-peer -peer payment applications. All of these companies are already connected to their banking partner and, and as such the banking rails in their country they probably already have, for example, uh, a relationship with a KYC provider like Identity Mind or Onfido. Uh, of course, if you're just getting started and you don't have this, this is the point in the process in which you start thinking about these things and, and getting uh, set up with, uh, with the APIs of your bank uh, as well as your KYC provider. Uh, one thing to consider here is that you likely want to set up a segregated account to hold the reserve. Uh, separate and apart from your existing operational accounts. Uh, that will just make it much easier to facilitate audits uh, and provide the transparency that you want to provide to the ecosystem around how you're managing the funds that you're holding on behalf of customers. Um, another thing to think about is the diversity of rails that you're able to support. Uh, and how do those rails map to the business needs that you're addressing? So for example, if you operate in a, in a cash heavy um, society in a country like Mexico or, or the Philippines, for example, you might, you'll likely want to support uh, not only bank transfer, but also cash deposit or cash pickup through uh, local kiosks or uh, corner store networks. The next step, once you have uh, the connection to, uh, to your local banking system set up, is to connect it to Stellar. Um, this is a step that we at the Stellar Development Foundation spend a lot of time and effort uh, on internally so we can make it as straightforward as possible. Uh, so if you're an issuing anchor, uh, the first thing you'll want to do is to issue a digital asset on Stellar, which will offer a one-to-one -one representation uh, of your home currency in the form of a digital asset. So this is you know, a, a stable coin, as, as most people refer to it as. Um, luckily, on Stellar, this actually requires zero smart contract scripting. Uh, it's surprisingly straightforward. You could actually do this in about a day or two. Um, once you are done with that, or if you are offering a fiat on and off ramp to another uh, asset, uh, an existing asset, such as what Finclusive is doing in the earlier example, you want to make sure that your fiat on and off ramp is compatible with the various applications and wallets within the Stellar ecosystem. So for example, you might allow users to make deposits and withdrawals on your own Anchor website, um, but you want it to be much more available and accessible than that. You want, for example, for other apps to be able to integrate your fiat on and off ramp uh, in, in their own interfaces so that other people can easily uh, buy and, and sell uh, your token. And to support this kind of interoperability, we've developed a, a protocol uh, together with the greater Stellar ecosystem so that everyone can speak the same language. Everybody can follow the same set of design patterns. And so for an anchor, what this means, uh, practically speaking, is that to support this protocol, you simply uh, set up a server that implements a specific set of API endpoints, and then apps and wallets implement a client, client that consumes that same API. And so, you know, to give a real world example of this, uh, if I was to build a global Venmo, for example, a, a global peer to peer payment application, and I wanted to support users in, uh, in Nigeria and Europe and the States, but I didn't want to have to go and, and set up my own banking relationships in each of these countries, I would just simply plug in the various stellar anchors that exist for the different countries of the world all by calling the same exact API. So it's the same API for USD as it is for Euro, as it is for Nigeria, uh, et cetera. And, and that is coincidentally exactly what we're doing with uh, the Latin American payment app uh, that Danelle mentioned, Vibrant. We're uh, 
pinging the same set of APIs for all of the anchors um, that are supporting the different currencies for the countries in which we're launching the app. And then the last step is to launch. Uh, the last missing step is to provide liquidity for your asset on the DEX. That means that you know, users can easily get into and out of the asset and uh, importantly, at a, at a good price. Um, you know, some anchors do this on their own. We've developed some tools to, to help you do that as well. Or you can work with a specialist market maker uh, to ensure that spreads are consistent and tight. Once everything is good to go, you can reach out to the ecosystem apps and wallets and make sure that they integrate your service. We're happy to help with that uh, and start building your business. Now, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, if all of this sounds daunting, uh, it's not. Luckily, you, you don't have to start from scratch uh, when launching an anchor. Uh, we've been hard at work to develop a, a pretty comprehensive and robust set of tools uh, that make it as easy as possible to implement all of the stellar side functionality. Uh, and I'd like to highlight just three of these tools today. Uh, the first is Polaris. Polaris is an anchor server reference implementation uh, that helps you set up your Stellar side server. Uh, Polaris is uh, an extendable Django app that comes with fully implemented endpoints, templates, database models. It's built in Python. That means that Polaris essentially provides a usable example of the code that an anchor would use to interface with the Stellar network. Uh, it provides clear methods for developers to integrate their own deposit and withdrawal forms, KYC processes, and banking route connections. And so in practice, what that means is that you can focus on implementing the business and, and country-specific related aspects of your product without having to spend much time figuring out how to connect the server to the Stellar network. And we found that companies that do choose to use Polaris are able to connect their local rails to Stellar and launch their anchor service much significantly faster than those that don't. I'd highly recommend it. Um, the second is the anchor validation suite. Uh, this is a set of 64 individual tests that help you confirm that your anchor implementation is compliant with the latest ecosystem specifications. Uh, it's a great resource for people that are getting started building an anchor and want to check what's missing. Is everything working properly? Uh, it's a one-stop shop to, to make sure that everything's working well. And if there's anything that is causing errors, it tells you exactly what it is that you need to fix and how to fix it. Um, and the third one that I'd like to call out here is the SEP24 demo client. This one is, uh, is one that I find extremely helpful for or anchors, um, essentially, if, if you want your anchor to be integrated with a third-party wallet or an app, um, you would have to somehow test that it's working on, on the wallet side. Um, and so this demo client makes it super easy to test this implementation both on testnet and pubnet um, or mainnet with a simulated wallet client. So that means that you don't have to go find uh, a wallet out there that will help work with you and test the, uh, the implementation. This is something that you can do on your own, on your own time, without having to have a lot of bilateral communication. So that once you've deployed everything, you can go ahead and reach out to all of the apps and wallets, and you'll know that it'll be super easy for them to go ahead and integrate the Anchor service that you've put in place. Next slide, please. So like I said, these tools make it much, much easier to launch an anchor service. I'd like to call out uh, one particular example. Uh, this is a quote from Tomas Teixeira from Ntokens, which is one of our Brazilian REI anchors, uh, one of our most recent uh, anchor launches. And they were able to use, take advantage of Polaris the code that's available there and launch from zero to, to launch in less than three months. And I think today with the other tools that are available, we could probably bring it even significantly less than three months to, to go from zero to launch. Next slide, please. So, 
you know, the, this is just a, a, a brief snapshot and overview of what the process is uh, and what the opportunity looks like to launch an anchor. I would encourage you to go and learn more. There's a lot uh, of material available on our website uh, at stellar.org slash learn slash anchor dash basics. And of course, we're more than happy to, uh, to talk to you about, about your plans, answer any questions. Uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. You can find us at partnerships at stellar.org. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. I would like to take some time to answer any questions. Um, and you can actually submit questions in the upper left-hand corner of, uh, of the Soho web app. So please go ahead and submit your questions. Hey, everyone. This is Jed. Uh, yeah, sorry I wasn't on earlier. The, there were technical difficulties. I was supposed to give the first part of that. Um, but I could answer questions, as Boris said. Um, and anything about the anchor model or how we first design the network, I'm happy to talk about. Jed, uh, here's, a, here's a question that I think people would be interested to hear your thoughts on. Can you comment on how you would manage liquidity for, your, uh, for an asset that you would issue? Um, you know, how do you manage exchange rates so that they don't drift uh, from real world exchange rates? Uh, sure, yeah. So, um, you know, you can either work with an external market maker, or m most anchors actually work with some external market maker because that's not their expertise to make the market. But if you wanted to do it yourself, uh, we released a tool called Kelp that can basically uh, put up uh, bids and asks inside the Stellar Decentralized Exchange, and it can also put up uh, orders in external exchanges and it can get rates from external places. So you could basically track the, the, you know, the actual FX rate. Like if you had a dollar anchor, for instance, you could track the FX rate and then, and then mirror that rate inside, uh, inside the seller network. And so, um, so there's kelp. You can check that out if, if you're interested. Uh, it, it basically automates this whole thing. Um, uh, yeah. Hey, Boris. Oh, yep. I was going to say, how about answering the question about Indian anchors? That's exactly the question I was about to answer. Uh, so India is a, is a super interesting market, obviously rife with potential. Uh, the regulatory situation has been fairly unclear uh, in India over the past year or so, um, but we have started to see that changing recently. And so we've uh, engaged with a number of very promising uh, interactions and discussions with uh, with existing and established fintech companies in India, and I, I'm encouraged to see that the regulatory situation is improving there. There's starting to be more and more certainty about operating in the space in India. So I, I think that's uh, you know I'm comfortable saying that's a very you know prime market for us that uh, that we're engaging with um, directly right now. Hey, Jed, uh, can an anchor set set up in a country different from the country it is planned to serve? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it could do that. I mean, the important thing for an anchor is, um, well, again, there's like basically two prime functions of an anchor. There's fiat on and off. And that's usually hard to do if you're if you're not set up in the in the country that you want to serve, or, or at least, you know, have some presence there. Like you probably need a bank account there or something and some connection to the local uh, payment networks to be able to get the, the money on and off. Uh, it, but the other function is to issue the token. Like you could technically issue like uh, like something denominated by by in some other currency that you don't actually, that, where you don't exist, but you just need some way to assure people that you actually will back that thing one-to-one. -one. So for instance, if you're not in Mexico, but you're issuing a peso token, you need to somehow reliably tell people uh, how you're going to back that thing. Um, which I assume is possible, but you know, there's no there's no technical requirement that you be in the country, but it definitely is easier and facilitates the thing. So, thanks. I just see a question here that says, um, "Do you have to be a banking business in order to be an anchor?" Uh, so the answer to that is, you don't have to be a bank, but you're gonna you're gonna be regulated on the edges because you are a financial. For the most part, you're touching fiat. And so you're a financial institution, so you don't have to be a bank, but there are they are financial institutions that normally are the best anchors because they do have, as Boris mentioned, 
uh, some of the regulatory issues covered. And they also um, have certificates and they're used to being able to, to touch the fiat on and off, which is um, part of what makes Anchor so important to the Stellar Network. Thanks, Danelle. Uh, here's another good question. Uh, what is the number one, what is a reason we've seen that anchors have failed in the past? I, my, my personal opinion on this is, uh, relates back to what Danelle mentioned, which is you really need to have a, a business plan around the anchor that, that is not just uh, related to the anchor services itself. So, like I mentioned, you know, in, in a low interest rate environment, you, you, it's hard to make money just on providing an on and off ramp. You need to also have a, a vision for what kind of products and services you'll build on top of that anchor infrastructure that leverages what it is that, that you're putting in place as an anchor. And I think importantly, just to, to follow up on that, as the network becomes even more and more uh, vibrant and has a lot more activity on it, then we're going to see that there are other models out there that we don't yet know about the how anchors can operate. So I think that um, failing anchors are not things that we want to see and frankly have, aren't things that we've seen. I just think that you, if you build a business around it, as we talked about, it just makes it so much easier so that you're not just focused on the anchor business. That's just part of the, the core work that you need to do to achieve things that you want to that you want to achieve on the network as well. Jed, here's a question for you. How long does it typically take to onboard as an anchor and how many engineers might you need to do it? Um, you know, it, it has varied a lot between the companies that have tried to do it. Um, I, I think InTokens did it in um, like a month, three weeks, something like that. Um, and uh, that, that's, that has a lot to do with the, the, the tools that Boris mentioned, the, the Polaris and like some other things in the testing suite that we've added recently. So the, the effort to do it is much, much less than it was in the past. So it really shouldn't take more than, than a, a month, I would say. And, you know, we have integration engineers that are happy to work with you um, to, 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 like, get you through the process. So it, it's pretty straightforward. Thanks, Jed. Uh, here's another interesting question. Who determines the fees that an anchor can charge for services? Danelle, do you want to take that one? Sure. I think that the anchor is going to determine the fees that they charge. I think that, uh, you know, obviously, if you are utilizing that anchor as a business, you can work with the anchor to, to help the anchor to set fees. For example, if you had a wallet and you were using the anchor services, you could ask the anchor to set fees at a certain amount, but ultimately it's the anchor who decides uh, the fees that they're going to charge to the end user, whether that be a business or a consumer. Uh, and also it probably depends a lot on what their business model is and how they've structured their anchor services in there. So ultimately the anchor has control. Here's another related question. How does the auditing and checks work for the reserve deposits and balances in Anchor bank accounts? So, uh, so again, this is largely up to the Anchor itself. I mean, the Stellar Network doesn't enforce any of this. It's, you know, you should think of Anchor as they're, they're not really different than any other financial institution that you'd use, you know, like PayPal or your bank or I any other fintech thing. So. Um, it's sort of up to them to to provide their customers the assurance that 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 the money is actually there and that they're legit. Um, so there's no standard way um, of doing that. Um, again, it, it, it's just analogous to whatever you normally do with your normal financial institutions. All right. Um, there's a question here uh, relating to Libra. Uh, curious to understand your view on what Facebook's Libra means for the Stellar model. Um, it seems quite similar to what you're doing. Oh, that's a good one. There are lots of differences between uh, Facebook's Libra model and our model. I think mostly just in terms of the, uh, you know, we're an open network that anyone can join. And so any anchor could become a part of our network. We don't actually have to allow you in. 
uh, to the network that you just build. And in fact, I think N Tokens did a lot of the work even before reaching out to us uh, in terms of how they built and um, and integrated with Stellar. Uh, and other anchors out there in the world can do that too. So that's an important distinction. Um, frankly, from my standpoint, I think the more folks that that join into blockchain generally and to create even a, a stronger ecosystem uh, out there for just use cases around blockchain, the better. And so the Libra model doesn't change our model, doesn't do anything to hamper our model, uh, but it actually just demonstrates that there are some significantly larger players out there who think that blockchain actually solves a lot of problems. Uh, and we think it does too. So that's a nice combination of them. Um, but I, I think that the models have similarity in terms of what, what Libra's stated mission is. Uh, and I, But I think that our focus on just allowing anyone to participate in the network and to bring their value and their creativity and innovation to it uh, is a model that ultimately uh, is, is going to bring a lot of success to a lot of uh, different folks. And also I think success to our mission, which is focused on the unbanked. Thanks, Danelle. Here's an interesting one. You know, so far we've been talking about fiat anchors, uh, but there are also non-fiat anchors or crypto anchors. Uh, Jed, could you tell us about what a crypto anchor is and, and what value they provide? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically you can represent anything in, in Stellar, like tokenize anything. So, you know, we typically talk about tokenizing fiat, but of course you can tokenize, tokenize uh, other cryptos or uh, other assets, barrels of oil or gold or anything like this. Um, so uh, basically a tokenized, say like a Bitcoin, is just a, a representation of Bitcoin inside Stellar. So it's it works the same way as a fiat anchor, like somebody basically takes the Bitcoin uh, and then issues the token onto Stellar and then it can move with cheaper fees and, and quicker than it does on the Bitcoin network, right? So, and then all of that, you can trade it for other things that, in, inside Stellar, right? So. Um, you can kind of leverage Stellar's decentralized exchange with these other other crypto assets um, and trade them for fiat tokens that are also on the network or lumens or, or what have you or against each other. Um, so basically just allows the whole, um, you know, basically it's like a, a very open-ended uh, exchange. So and you, you see examples of this with like Stellar X and like Stellar Port, things like that, that have, that have kind of provided interfaces to this that allow crypto deposits. Great, thanks, Jed. Uh, here's a, another question, which is, what is the one thing that would unlock significant growth for the Stellar Network? Danelle, I think it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. So it's not surprising that we're spending this time on anchors uh, and not surprising that the, the business team and a lot of the work that we've done to make it simple and streamlined to be able to integrate with Stellar as an anchor, uh, it's because I think anchors unlock a tremendous amount of opportunity and growth for Stellar. And we would love to see exponential growth of the anchor services that are available on Stellar. So I think with that comes this opportunity to create even more and more innovation uh, and to see more apps like Vibrant and more apps out there in the world that can actually reach those folks who don't have banks just down on, on the street corner uh, that they can go to. And so for us, I think that uh, our attention is focused on anchors because this is the key way to unlock significant growth. Here's a related question. Do you need many anchors in each country or do, is one sufficient? So you technically um, don't. Oh, Jed, why don't you go ahead? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, like you don't need many anchors in one in, in the same country. It, there's lots of different ways to get money on and off of the system, though, for instance. So like if you have one anchor that just basically takes deposits from bank accounts and one anchor that takes cash like in person uh then that would be useful right and uh in the same way that there you know there's like many different financial institutions that serve a particular market they, they can serve their customers in different ways right so they, they, they could have they could differentiate in, along these lines but but uh typically like if you have one really good one in a region you probably don't need multiple so One more question relating to crypto anchors. What's the difference in the regulatory environment for fiat anchors versus crypto anchors? Is there a big difference? Well, I think that um, regulators know very well how to regulate money 
And so uh, if you think about fiat anchors, there are a lot of very strict regulations with respect to um, what you can and can't do when you are holding fiat for an individual. Uh, I don't believe that the regulations are that different for crypto. I just don't think that the, the regulators have caught up into the crypto space yet. So um, I think that particularly as an anchor, when you're using and you're issuing a stable coin and it's one to one backed, you're going to have both uh, the, uh, the 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 fiat as well as the digital asset. So I think that you should assume that the regulations are the same, but every country is different. Every regulatory scheme is different. So you really have to pay attention to what's happening locally within your country. I just have to say like one of the most important things about being a good anchor is developing that trusted relationship with those folks that are going to actually consume your tokens or use your on and off ramps. Uh, and I think that's that should be the core focus of any anchor. So regulators are important. Um, but making sure that you're holding true to what you represent to the end user, whether that be a business or a consumer, is probably the most crucial part uh, about how you operate, whether you're crypto or fiat. And let's do one last question. Uh, someone asked, does Stellar want end consumers or end users to know that they're using Stellar or uh, are, is the idea to have Stellar as the underlying rails? Um, if one of you wants to take that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we'd be happy if the end user knows they're using Stellar. I think, but practically speaking, I think it's probably better if they don't. Like, for instance, with Vibrant, Stellar really isn't forefronted. Like, you could definitely use that app without really knowing about crypto or Stellar at all. Um, and, and I think, um, I think that's the direction that this will head long term. I mean, in, in the where in the phase we are now, most people will know that they're using Stellar, and users will know that they're using Stellar. But, but I think long term, it, I think it's better, um, and it'll be more successful if if those technicalities are kind of um, hidden in the UI, right? So people just know that they're sending money around. They don't necessarily need to know the nuts and bolts of it. I, I mean, if you think about it, it it's not um, that different in terms of today, like. Folks today don't really know when they're using ACH. Don't really, a lot of them don't understand the underpinnings of how that works. Um, I think it would be super cool for folks to understand our brand and to know what we stand for. But I also under, I also am like a believer in the fact that technology should just be simple, and you shouldn't have to understand or know all the details around it to make it work. Uh, so that's what we want to get to. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I hope this was helpful in explaining uh, the, the basics behind anchors on Stellar and the value that they provide to the ecosystem and the opportunities that they have uh, for themselves. Um, we will be posting a recording of this session uh, quite soon, so please check back for that. And like I mentioned, please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, at partnerships at stellar.org. Uh, and we just revamped the website recently, so there's a lot of great new material for you to find more information about the things that we discussed today. So with that, thank you very much, uh, and we'll see you soon.